Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mama's Time Out, where real moms come to talk. I'm uh, glad to have you listening, and I hope you enjoy the show today. I will be um, speaking with several guests today, so I'm glad that you're here. This is our Back to School Show special. And this is Patty, owner of LittleBitesNews.com, Gifts, Party Supplies, and More.com, MomsTimeOut.com, and WAHBusinessDirectory.com, where we offer shopping, child development, parenting resources, low-cost advertising, party supplies, gift ideas, and more, along with our social network and live support calling show for moms. And I am a former elementary teacher turned stay-at-home, work-at-home mom, and mother of two boys. And... Uh, Looking forward to uh, talking with our guests today um, since it is back to school time. And this is one way I can still contribute a little bit um, since I'm no longer teaching and gives me an opportunity to network with other parents as well. So um, our first guest will be speaking. Well, I believe it will be our first guest. I have to make sure they're all on the line still. Um, our first, our, one of our guests is author and father, G.L. Sharon, who will discuss um, internet safety tips and share some resources for working online um, safely for your children while they're doing research, for example. Uh, the internet is just a vast resource of information, as you know, and uh, I call it my home library. So. He will also share um, information on introducing students to technology and talk a little bit about his new book, Virus Game. And then I have radio host Pat Montgomery, who will be discussing the empty nest syndrome for those parents whose children are leaving the home to begin college away from home for the first time. And then uh, Janet Heller will also be here to discuss bullying and give us tips and advice to help our children cope with bullies or avoid them all together. And she also wrote a book on that topic um, called How the Moon Regained Her Shape. And so I'm looking forward to talking to each of the guests. And we may have a special guest caller calling in later in the show who um, will also contribute some of her insight on these topics, Stacey Cannonberg um, from Mom Central. And she is also the author of the Let's Get Ready for First Grade and Kindergarten Series book. So she will share some tips for young children. And uh, so we'll get her on here, too, towards the uh, end of the show. And again, the number to call in is 646-595-4516. Or you can always join us live in the chat here and uh, just send in your questions, and I'll relay them for you and uh, get them answered. So uh, if you decide to call in again, the number is 646-595-4516, and I will have um, the mics open up for questions towards the end of the show after the guest speakers have you know, talked about their subject, and we've gone over all that. This is a live support call-in show for moms of all ages and stages, featuring guest speakers, experts, and interviews, and fathers are, of course, welcome to call in as well as we do have a father on the line who will be talking about technology and Internet safety. So give us a call. The live call-in number is 646-595-4516. And um, I'm going to have each of our guests talk briefly about themselves and their topic for about 15 minutes each, and then uh, we'll take calls afterwards. So uh, let me see um, who's on the line, and hopefully uh, we can go in the order I have here. I think we have everybody on here, so let me see who this is. Hello, uh, who am I talking to? Hi, it's Pat Montgomery. Oh, hi, Pat. Glad to have you on here with us. Um, I'm gonna. I guess I'll go ahead and start with GL, and then I'm gonna have you talk, and then I'll have uh, Janet talk. So okay. let me see if I can get everybody on. Okay, this one's not clicking. Hello, who do I have on the line? Hello? This is Stacy Cannonberg. Oh, hi Stacy. Nice to have you with us. So you're here you're here already too. So 
hopefully all the others are here. Otherwise, I'll just have you contribute. You know, we may not be able to go in the order as planned, so <laughs> it's not a problem. Let me see who else is here just to make sure we have everybody. Okay, and who's the uh, other caller? Our other guest? Is this uh, GL or Janet? Uh, I, I'm online. This I'm is Janet? On the phone. Yeah, I'm on the phone. Okay, so I have Janet, Stacy, and Pat right now. So uh, GL isn't here yet, so hopefully he'll be calling in shortly. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead then and start with Pat, since uh, I did get you on the line first, <laughs> and have okay. you talk a little bit about yourself and what you do. And I'm sure you know how live clock radio shows can be because you host oh, one yourself. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and then when you're dealing with uh, Internet and technology issues sometimes, that's another problem <laughs> altogether. Exactly. That's a whole new show. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Pat. Okay, my, and uh, My name is Pat Montgomery, and I have a radio show for parents called Parents Rule, R-U-L-E, and my mm-hmm. website is parentsrulewithpat.com. I also am author of, the, of a book called Now You Know What I Know, Parenting Wisdom of a Grandmother, which you can get for $5 on my website as a download, so it's a good deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a good deal. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of wisdom in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's worth more than $5. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely worth more than $5. Uh, but you asked me to talk about empty nest stuff today, and uh-huh. I have been through having an empty nest and learned how to refluff my nest. Yeah. Um, it is a very difficult time when you see your child going off to college for the first time, and it's not just college, but that's the, you know, it's going in the military, it's getting an apartment of their own, it's whatever. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about school, so that's where I'm thinking about. Mm-hmm. But right. when my first child went to school, went away to college, I thought I would be thrilled. <laughs> Because yeah. he and I fought constantly, but I was mm-hmm. not. I felt like somebody had wrenched my heart out of my chest, and I cried all the way home. Um, it was awful. Um, yeah. You know, and I think parents just have to understand it's okay. It's okay to feel that way. I kept telling myself, this is silly. She's not dead. She's just a few hours away. I can get to her when I need to. But you still have to grieve. There's still a loss. There's a loss of that child's energy in your house. There's the the loss of seeing them smile and laugh. There's the loss of of your role as a parent that you have been so used to. And now all of a sudden, that role is not ever going to be the same again. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. I went to bed and for like two days and cried. <laughs> yeah. And I then I got imagine. out of bed and I moved on. <laughs> yeah. So just two days? <laughs> oh, no, I made myself day. get up. <laughs> yeah. Plus, I had two other kids at home. Yeah. But, yeah. And and I thought, well, okay, when the next one leaves, it'll be easier. No, it wasn't. You know, no. You, you love each of your children for different reasons. Mm-hmm. You love them all equally, but for different reasons. And when mm-hmm. those energies are gone out of your house, and you you just miss them so much. And you're right. so afraid, there's a piece of you in there that's afraid you failed them. You know, you're afraid maybe you didn't tell them something they needed to know to live, to get through life. Maybe you didn't show them something you needed to show them, and they're just going to fall flat on their face, and it's going to be all your fault. Right, yeah. And and it's not. You, you know, you yeah, it's did. a lot to worry about when they leave. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's yeah. so many things to worry about. And yeah. You know, good parents take good care of their kids, and they do everything Mm -hmm. they can. And you just got to let them go, and you've got to understand that they are going to go. That's really important. And then you've got to just spend as much time with them as you can. One of the things I thought that would have helped had I done this would have been to write down, as I thought, of little things, little sayings or um, inspirational stories or little quotations and, and handed it to them as they left to go to college because I stood there with each child thinking, okay, now this time I have something brilliant that I'm going to come up with and say to them and it's going to change their lives as they start their new life. Mm-hmm. And I had nothing. <laughs> mm, yeah. You know, nothing. I was so engrossed in my own 
grief. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That I couldn't think of anything, and and as I thought about it later, I thought, you know, that would have been a great thing to do, and it would have given them something that they could have used to help them. Uh-huh. So that's something I'd suggest. But yeah. did you have any questions about this, or do you want me to keep rambling? <laughs> Uh, no, I mean that sounds like a, a you know some good ideas and and any tips you have, I'm sure parents will definitely appreciate it. And I know I'm, I'm going to have to keep notes here so that I know how to prepare because <laughs> I, I'm going to have to prepare. I'm going to fill empty nest when my son goes to preschool soon. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fill empty nest for that. that. <laughs> my yeah, be, son went out of state to college, and that was really hard because he was <laughs> the youngest and uh-huh. he went out of state, so he wasn't. He was no. He was, wasn't like the other two where they were easily accessible if I needed to get to them. Uh huh. Yeah, but, yeah. When they go out of state, that's got to be even worse. I keep telling mine, no, you're going to go to college here, right? <laughs> of course, <laughs> <laughs> see, you know, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, I, you, you can stay here for as long as you want. <laughs> that's what yeah, my dad exactly. would tell me. <laughs> but you know what? I my my famous quote is that I came up with is um, the only thing that's worse than your child leaving home is your child not leaving home. Right. Because now I have friends who have kids who uh-huh. won't leave home, and they're 30 years old, and they're still sitting on the right. couch playing video games, and they're not. Oh, working, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a common <laughs> thing, too. And then there's a lot of them that go to college and come back home or and drop okay. out of college and, and come back. And <laughs> right. And my kids yeah. did that. I mean, they went to school, they graduated, and then they came home. Well, two of them did um, for just a few months. So mm-hmm. they got their jobs and got them, their lives straightened out, and then they got their own apartments and moved out. Right. And, they're, you know, one of the things that I did with each of them before they left home, which was really, really fun, and I've never regretted it for a second, is we both played mm-hmm. hooky one day. In the mm-hmm. spring on their senior year, I took off from work. They took off from school, and we went and played all day long. Oh, that's a good idea. We, we just had the best time, and it was something that we all remember. And it, it just, it was just something that really helped me, knowing uh-huh. that I had done that. Right. Um, the and you did that before they left, you think? Yeah, I did it during their uh-huh. spring of their senior year. Uh-huh, okay. And uh-huh. Um, another thing that you can do is plan ahead of time, you know, talk, be talking to them and say, okay, now, you know, how often are we going to call each other? We need to, just for safety reasons, you need to talk to that child every week, at least once. Right. Now, right. Most of the time you're going to talk to them more often with cell phones and everything. But when my daughter mm-hmm. first went to school, we didn't really have cell phones um, as as easily as we do now. But um, right. So you plan once a week, every Sunday night or every Tuesday night or whatever, you know, at 6 o'clock, we're talking to each other. You're calling me or I'm calling you, and you set that up ahead of time. And that gives you a little bit of peace of mind. Right. So you know that they're going to, you know, that if you don't hear from them, something's wrong. Right, right. And, and so that helps. You know, yeah. Yeah, lots of times, uh, tragically, parents find out otherwise that something happened to their child while they were away at college because they didn't keep in touch with them enough, so... Well, yeah. exactly right. And so there's yeah. a fine balance you have to walk there between yeah. overdoing it and being a helicopter parent. Right, right. And between and not paying enough attention. So you have right. to you have to walk that balance in there. Right, right. Um, but spend a lot of time talking to them. Just get to know them a little better before they go. And uh-huh. what, I, what I found with my kids is that we became so much closer when they went to college. I right. started trying to treat them as adults. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I figured everybody else was. I should, too. <laughs> and, right. and as I started doing that, they started coming to me more for advice. And, uh-huh. and when I wasn't trying to force my mom role down their throats when they were being seen as adults and seeing themselves as adults, then they started coming to me and asking my advice, and that was a huge shock. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that really worked great. Um, yeah. You know, my kids are all married now, and that's another big shock we can talk about sometime. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. all of a sudden, yeah, you're no longer big, the most big important person in their life, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Right. Yeah, because then you become the mother-in-law and <laughs> exactly. all that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, okay, well, those are some great tips. And um, any of the uh, other callers, um, Janet or uh, Susan, do you have any, or Stacy, I'm sorry, do you have any other uh, tips on that area or experience in that area that you'd like to share? This is Stacy. My my kids are going into fourth grade and second grade, so I I can't even imagine <laughs> going through what you just are describing. I'm upset that my kids are getting ready to go to school in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. I'm the bus, so I drop them off in the morning and I pick them up from school. So I'm I'm kind of just missing them not being around all day. We, I work from home, so I I see them mm-hmm. all day long. So oh, yeah. Um, so I, she's on the other end of the spectrum, and so. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to her and say, "Oh my gosh, I will treasure every day." <laughs> every just day, yeah. Of yeah. that going off. Yeah. I know it's kind of scary. Like I said, my son's going to be going to preschool soon, and you know, I I still have our our youngest at home, but you know, it's just going to be kind of sad. You know, he's not going to be around making all the noise. That he makes. <laughs> You just have to find other things to do. I started finding little yeah. hobbies for myself. Yeah, that helped a lot. Yeah, well, that's why, you know, hopefully working at home will keep, you know, some of the loneliness away. You'll actually so. find that you actually have time to work at home. <laughs> yeah, right. Have more time and not have the crazy hours I have now. <laughs> right, exactly. You might sleep okay. a little more at night. Yeah, right. So, um, Janet, do you have children or? Uh, no, no, I don't. No. But okay. I think uh, I think what, what Patty and Stacy have said sounds very, very useful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, let's see. Uh, I guess we'll just go ahead and um, continue this conversation um, towards the end if we have any other callers or questions. And uh, then I'll, um, you know, go back around and see who else uh, has anything to contribute on our next speaker since we're kind of limited on time and I want to fit you all in. So uh, we'll go ahead and have uh, Janet um, talk next. And uh, Janet, you uh, wrote the book, How the Moon Regained Her Shape. So uh, if you would like to uh, tell us a little bit about that book and what brought you to write it and uh, go from there. I was bullied when I entered uh, afternoon kindergarten. I was a new student in the school. My parents had moved from one city to another, and like a lot of new kids, I got bullied. At first, none of the kids would play with me during recess, and then finally that subsided, and one little boy would throw stones at me. But the worst actually was a little girl who would say to me every day, you're so skinny, I can see right through you. And mm. today, today I'm middle-aged, and I might take that as a compliment. But <laughs> Not really, <laughs> At the time, it was just overwhelming, and I started to believe what my bully was saying because I heard this every day. It was like brainwashing, so I thought there was something terribly wrong with my body. Um, And uh, I told my mom, and she said, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. Well, that Mm -hmm. never made much sense to me (laughs) because I, I was terribly hurt by the bullying, and what I really needed was for my mom to give me advice. You know, like, what mm-hmm. are you doing uh, when the bully, you know, says this stuff to you? What do you say to her? Do you walk away? Have you told the teacher? I needed advice and questions like that because I was just five years old when this started, and I was clueless. Mm-hmm. I, I really had no idea what to do to, to stop the bully. Right, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I know. Had, I, I'll go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to mention I had a friend that was bullied um, in elementary school, and I felt kind of helpless as as her friend and, you know, other students as well because there was this, just this huge girl that would just, after school, pick on her and push her down the playground. And everybody felt so intimidated, I think, that nobody, you know, did anything, nobody told on her. I mean, I, I believe we told um, our parents, but I don't know that the school ever did anything about it. I mean, I don't know what, exactly why nothing was ever done, but thankfully the girl finally moved away. And that's when it finally stopped. But unfortunately, my friend had to suffer through that, you know, for just that whole year of, of uh, elementary school. Well, as as an adult, I wanted to do something to help kids. Uh-huh. Uh, so I, I wrote this book. Um, I've been reading a lot of Native American legends uh-huh. for some research that I was doing. I'm a college professor, and I was doing research on Native American literature. 
and I decided that I would write my own legend about bullying, mm-hmm. and that's what how the moon regained her shape is. The the sun bullies the moon, and the mm-hmm. moon is so unhappy that she shrinks, mm-hmm. and that's how mm-hmm. I felt when I was bullied as a kid. Right. And then the moon uh, tells her friend the comet, and he tells her about people on Earth who can help her. And the moon makes some new friends on Earth who help her rebuild her self-esteem by telling her how wonderful she is and how much she means to them. And eventually Mm -hmm. she slowly regains her full size. Sounds like a really great book. Really, uh, I saw, you know, the cover of it and the the illustrations and the color looked really nice. And I'm going to have to check that one out for sure. (laughs) It's it's won won four national awards. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And you wrote this book a year ago or a couple years ago? I, I actually wrote it in 1992. Um, oh, but 1992. Bullying, but I didn't find a publisher um, till, uh fairly recently. And the book uh, the book came out in hardback in 06 and paperback in 07. And now you can also get it in Spanish and audio. Wow, that's great. Okay. And uh, so through your childhood experiences of bullying, that's kind of what caused your inspiration, I guess we can call it, to write the book. And uh, how, do you, how does this book help children and parents with bullying? Does it teach them um, ways to cope or does it give them, uh, you know, ideas on how to, how to report it as well or, you know, how to handle in- the intimidation factor like I was talking to you about? Well, parents could read How the Moon Regains Her Shape to Their Children or mm-hmm. with their children, if the kid knows how to read. It's at a second grade reading level. Mm-hmm. So if, say, your child is in kindergarten or something, you could read it to the child. If the child is second grade or older, the child would be able to read uh, it with, you know, together with you. And then you might want to discuss it, especially if you suspect that bullying is going on. Um, mm-hmm. And the book teaches kids um, to tell others if there's bullying going on because that's what the moon winds up doing because that's how you get help. Part mm-hmm. of my problem was I was bottling this up. Right. And I only told my mom when she asked me what was happening. And then when she was sort of discouraging in her response, I thought that adults didn't care what was happening to me. Yeah. So my mm-hmm. book is trying to show children that people do care what's happening to you. And that mm-hmm. if you turn to other people and tell them, they can help you. Right. So if it's not your parents, you know, that do something, maybe the teacher or the principal or some other adult will step in. Right. And to tell your friends, because you were talking about bullying where the kids didn't know what to do. If the kids had banded yeah. together, they probably could stand up against the bully. Because yeah. bullies sort of thrive on secrecy. And right. if a bunch of kids stand up against the bully and say, you know, we don't want you bothering our friend Susan or whoever was getting pushed around, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. the bully is much less likely to, to pester that person again. Right. So if, if they all had just said something as a group, the bully probably would have just stepped back and said, whoa, everybody's against me. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. So you don't recommend them actually fighting back physically? or uh, any Um, of that. If that's appropriate, in my case, the worst bullying was verbal. Mm -hmm. And kids may need to be taught techniques to deal with that. If the bullying is physical, my my personal feeling is that kids have the right to to fight back if there is physical bullying Mm -hmm. um, in whatever way is appropriate. For example, at one point during recess, a little boy pushed me down, and I pushed him down, and he left me alone after that. Right. Um, you know, I didn't um, break his leg or, you know, something extremely violent, but I responded mm-hmm. in what I think is a reasonably appropriate way. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, I think that school systems should teach kids self-defense. Yeah. A, yeah, a, lot, of, a lot of self-defense mm-hmm. is not aggressive but is defensive and teaches you how to block blows and how to get away from someone charging at you and stuff like that. Right, right, so right. So people's image right. of self-defense I, I is, is, is that it's mostly offensive, but a lot of it is defense. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, it is something that you uh, you kind of don't want to encourage fighting, but at the same time, if they, if they have to defend themselves, you know, self-defense is, is your only weapon. You have to do what you have to do. 
people don't have to agree with me on that, and that isn't in, in the book, but um, mm-hmm. my recommendation would be that, that school systems do, as part of physical education, teach all children some self-defense skills. Because then I think yeah. bullies would be less likely to pick on people if they knew that everyone in the class uh, could defend themselves. Right. And yeah. uh, I also think that, that schools and other organizations that deal with kids should have workshops uh, on bullying to teach kids what it is and what they can do about it. Right. And um, what are some ways that you would encourage kids to uh, open up and discuss the bullying? I mean, what if the bully, you know, is so, has been threatening them, you know, a lot, and if they tell they're going to, you know, do this to them or do this to their friend or this to their brother or sister, how do you how do you get them to open up to talk about it? That That is a difficult situation. I strongly recommend that parents talk to their ki- kids about what's been going on every day, you know, maybe when they come home from school or come home from summer camp or come home from whatever the activity is, uh, ask them how things have been going and, you know, if anything uh, interesting or unusual happened during the day. And if you make that a habit and show the kid that you really care what's going on, the kid is likely to tell you. You could Mm -hmm. also teach children that when bullies threaten to do something to them, if they tell, what they're basically trying to do is to maintain secrecy. Because mm-hmm. bullies thr- bullies um, have sort of a power trip from the bullying. Mm-hmm. But if you tell people it can disrupt that power trip because then the appropriate adult authorities can step in, whether it's right. a coach or a teacher or a neighbor or a parent. Um, I, I, do, I do think that uh, in many cases kids need the help of adults or at least of their friends to deal with a bullying situation. Right. I, I agree with that, and I mean, there's now there's even cyberbullying, and that was something I was going to bring up with uh, GL, but I don't know that he's on the line yet. But um, you know, that's still related to the bullying topic. Where you know, I've, I'm sure you're familiar with that recent case on MySpace, where the girl, teenage girl, committed suicide as a result of online bullying that was actually done by the parents <laughs> of one of the other teens. So. Right, a, a parent of one of this girl's former friends, I guess. The yeah. Had had become, you know, estranged from one another, and the parent felt that she had to step in. In that case, there was inappropriate uh, action mm-hmm. by the parent. Right, um, right. I, so, I do think yeah. it's important that, that parents try to um, mediate some of these disputes, but I think it crosses the line when the parent becomes a bully herself. Right, yeah, because I mean, you can't be abu- abusing, you know, children. I mean, these are, you know, if they're teenagers, but they're still children. So <laughs> that that was pretty illogical of her. So I yeah, think, so. I think that parent didn't realize how vulnerable kids can be. Kids mm-hmm. can be extremely vulnerable to bullying, mm-hmm. and um, I I think the parent just wanted to hurt the kid's feelings. But what she wound up doing was was so awful that that the child just went off the deep end. Right, right, right. And if the child already has self-esteem issues or, you know, maybe depression or she, you know, she something did. else. She did, she did. Yeah, then, you know, it's just going to compound the whole bullying issue and their life's just going to feel miserable and they're going to think that's the only solution. You know, a lot of times that's how, uh, how your mentality is as a teenager. You, you just you know, want to finalize things, and we don't think about the future and and other solutions, you know, being available to you. So, yes, that was a really tragic, tragic situation. Right. So um, any other uh, ideas on how schools and, and sports teams and other organizations can help discourage bullying from occurring? I think some a lot of the bullying occurs whenever there are differences, whether somebody wears glasses, is short, is tall, is skinny, is fat, um, is uh, uh, bad at sports, not so great at school, is a different religion, different skin color. We're trying to have a multicultural society, and I think that kids need to be taught to respect differences rather than mm-hmm. to see differences as something that is threatening and scary and awful. Right. And I think right. if we teach kids to respect differences and um, to respect also their own bodies and their own skills, we all have different mm-hmm. strengths and skills, and that's what makes our society interesting. 
And right. kids need to see that that's a strength of American society and not something that deserves bullying. Right. All right. I mean, you, you know, we really have to stick to the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You don't want to be, you know, somebody bullying you, so why bully somebody else? You know, you have to treat people with respect and the same respect that you want for yourself. So I definitely agree with that. And uh, I was going to have somebody um, speaking about diversity today as well, but she had to cancel out at the last minute. Uh, her sister-in-law was having a baby, so hopefully I'll get her back on here, um, I think, next month. Um, we'll have her on here to talk more about that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that's what it boils down to, is accepting other people for who they are and, and their differences, you know, whether it's physical, religious, you know, whatever the difference is. And uh, kids need to learn that, how important that is. So uh, Kids can also find that they can be good friends with someone who looks different from them. I mean, there's no good reason why a skinny kid and a chubby kid can't be friends or why, you know, uh, when my niece was in kindergarten, she had a, a birthday party, and she introduced me to her little boyfriend who was African, African American. I don't think she realized that they were different races because she had right. been brought up, you know, not to see that as something that made someone bad or threatening. And this mm-hmm. kid was one of the handsomest young children I'd ever seen in my life. You know, right. so I could see why she thought he was interesting. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, you can't always favor somebody just because they have the color of hair that you like or they're skinny or fat or whatever. You have to like them for who they are as a person. So, yeah. So um, any any other thoughts on that from uh, our other um, guests? Well, this is Pat, and I am so glad that you've written this book. I, I probably will go in and buy it because I there's so many, such a need today for the parents to be able to talk to the child about whether they're being bullied. And this is such a great way to introduce that topic with your children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was really impressed with, you know, just from what I've read about your book. I didn't get to get a copy of it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I definitely think it's something that parents definitely need to include in their library for their children. It definitely sounds like a great book and, and I'm not too familiar with very many others written on the on the topic of bullying for, you know, children at a young age. Myself I I don't recall coming across them, you know. No, me either. I, I think it's good. Yeah. This yeah. is this is Stacy. I just wanted to comment I did see her on our on my local television show, The Morning Blend, and I was all excited about what she was doing with the fact that there are not um, books on bullying. And being uh-huh. my kids, um, again, they had just finished third grade and first grade. I had my very first experience when my daughter came home and said, Mom, I have a bully in our classroom, and I'm not sure what to do about it. And I and I can kind of, I was just at a loss. It's like, okay, I've been prepared for this moment, but I wasn't expecting it in third grade. Um, mm-hmm. So we had a long talk, and and I guess, you know, it, it, it was just one of those things where, okay, do I go to the teacher? Do I go to the principal? What You know, where do you want me to be involved in this? And she said, well, Mom, to be really honest, this boy is going through some very hard times. His parents are going through a really bad divorce, and I know he's taking it out on us. And I said, well, Heidi, tell me what you want me to do. And she said, "Well, Mom, I, I think I want to. I think I want to handle it on my own." And so we we role played and said, to get, "You know, you need to be firm with him and say, look, 'Look, you're being mean. Why are you so mean?'" And 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 she really did. She had a really great conversation with him, and his attitude completely changed. And it came to one of those situations where it was kind of a push and a shove, where he got in her face, and she just got really mad and walked back up to him and said, "Look." Do you want to be the bully? Because everybody in this classroom thinks you're the bully. Is that how you want to be thought of, you know, for the rest of your school life at this school as the school bully? Mm -hmm. You know, and he Mm -hmm. kind of quivered down and and said, well, no. And she said, well, then why are you taking your pencil and, and, and poking us and, you know, hard? You're hurting us. Why are you doing this? And and it's right. really one of those situations where she just really um, put it right back at him. And I had been talking to the principal, and I had been talking to her teacher without her knowing about it. And it looks like um, it was. It took a couple of students to stand up to him to really make him realize 
that he was being viewed in this not so favorable light. And his mom, I, I talked to his mom, and she's just like, you know, I know he's been really naughty at school. And, you know, it was almost to the point that he needed a little bit of peer pressure. And so I just think having that, having that open dialogue, and, and uh, you hit it on the head. When your kids come home from school, you should be, I always call it, you know, stop, drop, and listen. When they walk in the door or I'm the bus, so in my case when we get in the vehicle to drive home, I am, they have my undivided attention, and they each take their turn, and they tell me about their day. So right. I feel like I know everything that's going on. And the, the number one thing that I tell parents, because I get this call a lot, is the most important thing that you can do is to be involved in school. The more kids that know your name as the parent, mm-hmm. the less likely they're going to bully your child. Right. They don't want to have to face you. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to have to look in your eyes. And this little boy was a new boy to our district, so he did not know me personally. But it feels uh-huh. like he was on my team, and I got to know him. And he goes, how do you know my name? And I said, well, I'm, Heidi Ke- I'm Heidi's mom. And he's he's like, oh. And I said, well, I'm glad you guys worked out your differences. I think he thought I was going to yell at him. And he mm-hmm. said, yeah, yeah, I, I'm glad we did too. And and you know what? That little boy changed in, in the time from when she talked to him to the end of school. His teachers could see a difference. The principal could see a difference. And his mom who was at field day that day only because we really pushed her to come and volunteer and be a part of it. Um, and I think that meant a lot to him. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, parent involvement definitely makes a big difference on how kids' behavior outcomes are in the classroom and at school and everywhere else. So definitely important. Stacey, I think so, you handled it really well asking Heidi what she wanted you to do because well, that's key there. She knows me well enough to know that, you know, I will get involved, and, you know, I, she wanted to handle this one on her own. So mm-hmm. I Are you sure her. she's and, only in fourth grade? Well, you know what, mm-hmm. I, because I work from home and because she, you know, I, I do a lot with education, I'm helping schools across the country, I think she has a little different idea. She edits books, for goodness sakes. Um, wow. So she has a little different. Um, when I was her age, I didn't realize I could change a word in a book. And so mm-hmm. when my kids are reading manuscripts for other authors, they get that they, that their information is valuable. What they have to say makes sense because it, many times I'm a child, I'm a children's author. My target market is them. So if they look at something and say, "Oh, this book is about friends along the way. Why don't we know their names?" Well, mm-hmm. I can, you know, I would have never thought of that. <laughs> and I can go back to the author and the illustrator and say, "Why don't we know their names?" Because I could have read it a thousand times and would have never seen what they see. So when people call me and say I'm writing a book, I say, first thing you need to do if it's for kids, what do the kids say? And the author's like, mm-hmm. well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, mm-hmm. your target market's kids. What did the kids say after they read your book? Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. That's great that they're able to give you that insight <laughs> and that they're, you know, they're uh, at that level to do that. So, yeah, I, think um, I think it's also good that Heidi knew that the child's motive for being mean had nothing to do with her, that it had to do with problems in his own life, which is true in many cases with bullies. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. A lot of times they're coming from an abusive home or, you know, where they're not being treated very well themselves. So that's all they learn and that's how they treat others. And Sometimes they just have, you know, anger issues um, because something else is going on or they didn't have a good sleep that night or, you know, maybe they're just a grumpy person overall, but they have to learn how to deal with those type of feelings, too, in a constructive way. So, Because parents um, may sometimes have to tell kids what Heidi already realized, which is that bullying is really the bully's problem. The target mm-hmm. of the bully doesn't cause the problem. Right. It's not the target's fault. And whatever right. the bully says really shouldn't be taken very seriously by the child who gets targeted. Right. But that's I think it's sure. important. I think it's important because that bully is a, is one of those buzzwords that's going around that maybe little kids. Because honestly, I wasn't thinking about bullying when they were that little. You know, preschool, kindergarten, first grade. Mm-hmm. I was talking. About, but we are. We're talking about bullies already. And many mm-hmm. times after talking to teachers, it's the group of little girls that can sometimes be the world's worst critic to somebody else. They don't mean to, but they're very vocal. Oh, I don't like that outfit. Oh, do you always wear pink all the time? Why do you? Why are all your clothes always? Pink? pink well mm-hmm. you know they don't realize that now that child's going home going mommy i can't wear any more pink you know and it's just, it's it's things those kind of conversations that i think it's important for us to 
you know, hear what's going on and then give the kids those tools in which to handle. And then the parents, because I think sometimes we're helpless as to not knowing what to say and we're not really sure what's being, you know, taught at school. But kids have heard the word bully. They just don't want it mm-hmm. to be them. And they might not realize, you know what, gosh, when I said that to that little girl about the pink stuff, I kind of was being a bully. Right. I'm glad you brought that up about the girls because there's a lot of girls there now that are bullying. And, in fact, more girls are bullying than boys. Mm -hmm. Um, And boys, oftentimes the bullying is a physical thing where they're pushing or they're doing. Girls are mean. Mm -hmm. And and they are very damaging to little self-esteem. Right. Well, they had that movie come out, Mean Girls, I think it was called. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely, I mean, I've, you know, I read an article recently about how bullying does start, you know, preschool level because there's, you know, they start saying, oh, I'm not going to invite you to my party or, you know, you're this and you're that and start calling names, so it starts young. So I was it. talking to some uh, adult men the other day, and they were on sports teams where they got bullied, especially when they were new on the team and they were young, say on a high school uh, varsity team. And they mm-hmm. said that sometimes there would be bullying in that sort of a situation where the other guys would say, you don't belong on this team, you're not good enough, blah, 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 blah. So boys can also do it, but you're right. Um, with, with boys, a lot of the bullying tends to be more, more physical, uh, mm-hmm. whereas with girls it's more name-calling and exclusion. Right. And a lot of the and a lot of the cyber bullying is done by girls. Yeah. And that's hard to trace. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, you know, how how do you think uh parents, especially of teens, you know, that are are bullying still, um, how do you suggest parents nip that in the bud and put an end to it? I think that parents have to take seriously when say another parent or a teacher uh, or a child tells them that their own kid is, is, is being a bully or is doing cyberbullying or whatever. I, I talked to a friend, and her son apparently, she found out, was uh, was bullying an, a, a classmate who was a girl. And she and her husband talked with him, and they took this very seriously, and they told him they didn't want this to continue and why it wasn't appropriate behavior. And he stopped. I mean, as kids are growing up, they try different kinds of behavior, and they need to learn from adults um, you know what is appropriate behavior. Uh, none right. of us, so you know, are born knowing how people should act in a civil society, and mm-hmm. we need we need to learn this because otherwise we can grow up and turn out to be obnoxious people or even criminals if we don't right. learn appropriate social skills. I mean, there are ways of dealing with people that are kind and respectful, and that tend to result in you having friends. And there are ways of dealing with people that are unkind, disrespectful, and hostile and tend to result in in isolation of the individual. And kids need to learn to to choose the kinds of activities that that are respectful and that will uh, gain them uh, friends and a good role in society. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. You definitely have to uh, teach them how to respect others. I mean, it's back to that topic, too. I mean... It's just, uh, I don't know, something that definitely has to start at a young age, I mean, with the social skills, because, I mean, like they say, you know, children who've been neglected and, you know, become feral children, they are, they have no social skills and they are, you know, they, you become animal instincts, like, if you don't have the social skills and the training and, and somebody to uh, teach you properly how to how to treat others, so, yeah. Okay, um any any other uh, input on the topic of bullying or uh on emptiness syndrome and how to deal with that? Yeah, okay. Um Stacy, I'll go ahead and have you uh talk a little bit about uh what what you do and uh I know I have you scheduled um also to come in November to talk, but uh you can go ahead and, you know, share some input on these topics and uh, how you would, you know, prepare young children for school. I was a mom trying to get my own kids ready for, for school, and my kids at the time were one and three. And mm-hmm. I, I had been walking with a neighbor who had a daughter who had just finished kindergarten, 
And she started telling me about everything her daughter was learning in kindergarten. And she was using words like positional words, high-frequency words, sight words, skip counting. And I, I was lost. I'm like, what, what are you, you're talking about kindergarten? I don't, what, what you know, sight words, what's that? Um, uh-huh. So it's a whole new language. So I, I panicked, I, of course, being the good mom that I am. I had been mm-hmm. doing a lot of reading with my kids, but I, I wanted to find that one magic book that I could sit down that had the curriculum in it, and all the books mm-hmm. I could find were geared for, for parents to read, but I, I really wanted something that was geared for kids, and I couldn't find what I was looking for. So it was, th- it was honestly through a series of Oprah shows, and um, here I am. I wrote Let's Get Ready for Kindergarten, and now we've got Let's Get Ready for First Grade, and the Spanish book Let's Get Ready for Kindergarten is coming out in September. So the books are, um, I'm not a teacher, but I sat down with teachers all across the country, uh, did the research, and basically put together kind of um, the cliff notes to everything you need, you need to know for kindergarten, but I wrote it for my one- and three-year-old at the time. So I wanted it to be something like the good night moon of kindergarten that you just read over and over and over so these are the letters all mixed up and then mm-hmm. you know these are the, the numbers all mixed up because that's what they're testing kids when kids come to kindergarten now five years ago mm-hmm. you could your kindergarten teacher would teach your children everything they needed to know now mm-hmm. when kids are coming to school they test them on all 26 letters all mixed up they teach them on zero to ten all mixed up on basic shapes colors Coins. I mean, the average parent of a, a, a kindergartner doesn't realize that kids are tested on coins. We think they're going to swallow them, so we're not thinking yeah. coins. So oh, they're yeah. testing them on counting objects to 10 and how far they can count to 100. So that first parent-teacher conference that you go to um, sometime in October, you're sitting down and they say, well, Johnny only knew five of 26 letters, and he, mm-hmm. couldn't only, he could only recognize two of the numbers, zero to ten. And you're sitting there as a parent going, well, well, well wait, why didn't you tell me this before we, we started this? Why didn't you hand me this magic list of this is everything mm-hmm. that they need to know before you even um, sit down and talk to me? Because I would have been working on that. I didn't realize it was that advanced. And yeah. so what I, I did the research and found that 38 states are talking about mandatory four-year-old kindergarten. And I, I felt that, you know what, mm-hmm. there's, there's a breakdown. Parents aren't getting the information. Where's the public service announcement saying those seven things I just said? Why, why aren't we doing a better job of teaching kids what they need to know? It's kind of like the seatbelt law. If you teach a child to wear the seatbelt, they're going to teach grandma, they're going to teach grandpa, they're going to teach mom, they're going to teach big brother. They're going to mm-hmm. say, you've got to wear your seatbelt. Mom, you don't have your seatbelt on. Make sure you put your seatbelt on. If you teach a child, we need to know the alphabet all mixed up, they're going to be hounding mom and dad until they know it all. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I was looking for that magic book, couldn't find it, decided to write, and, and then Oprah had a, a show on self-publishing, so I decided to self-publish my books that are now mm-hmm. available inside schools across the country. So I get a lot of yeah. teachers that go, duh, why didn't I think of that? I do this every year. And <laughs> I don't know if you, if you would have thought of it, I'd have bought it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they look like really great books, nice and colorful as well, and, uh, you know, you can write on them and wipe them off, it looks like, as well. Exactly, and it's made, I have a lot of publishers that, that tell, they tease me and say, Stacey, we would have never used the kind of material that you use because it's dry erase mm-hmm. pages. And I said, uh-huh. I did that for a reason, because I'm a mom. I know what it's yeah. like. To, you know, every book you open up as a parent, they say, read to your kids, read to your kids, read to your kids. Well, having a one- and a three-year-old, the tug-of-war, the number of books that I've had rip. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what? You want to read to your kids, but you're afraid to hand on these beautiful books that Grandma gives you. And you're like, oh. Right. So I was looking for something that, uh, you know, an 18-month-old could drool all over and you could wipe up. And they could they right. get their size so they feel like they're in control of it. And when I do right. send them out to families, the first thing that happens if the kids are in the room when they're opening up the books, the kids grab them, open them up, and proceed to tell their parents everything they know, which is mm-hmm. key because then you know what they don't know. <laughs> and right. I, was, and I, I was at a, um, a book signing um and a teacher had come up, and she said, you know, I've seen you on TV in the past, but, you know, these books are just way too advanced for my kids. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, how, how old is your son? And he's standing right there. She's like, well, he's 18 months, but I, I'm, a, I'm a kindergarten teacher, and these books are way too advanced. And I said, well, these are just books that you just read. You know, they're not meant to master the skills before you go to kindergarten. It's just like the Good Night mm-hmm. Moon book. Kids, when they get the Good Night Moon book, aren't supposed to know it all. You just read it over and over and over, and it's repetitive. 
And I said, look, there's a photographer here who wants to take a pretty picture. Can, is it possible your son would get in the picture? She's like, oh, sure, sure. So we open the book, and it's the let's say each word page, and the little boy points to the picture on the page, and he says, igloo. And I'm looking mm-hmm. at him, and I'm like, how, uh, wait a second, how old is he? She's like 18 months. I'm like, okay, of all the words for this boy to know in this book, I would have never thought he would have known <laughs> igloo. And she looks yeah, at me, really. and she's like, I'm the teacher. You know, leave it to me, of all people, to know that, you know what, he probably knows a lot more than I think he knows. This is his opportunity to now show me. So it was kind of one of those things where I didn't invent the alphabet. I didn't invite, you know, I didn't invent um, counting. There's nothing in this book that was, you know, absolutely mind shattering. It's the fact that I put it all together in the package that everyone's like, oh, every kid needs to know this book before they go to school. That's why I wrote it. Right. Right. Well, my phone is dying. <laughs> <laughs> 